slide right here, this concept, there is a direct through line between what we're about to talk about to why the world looks the way it does in 2020, and that is the invention of the printing press. Now I'll show you how the fact that this was created in modern day Germany at the time by Johann Gutenberg, that this led to European nations becoming the dominant nations in the world throughout imperialism, throughout the Industrial Revolution, throughout uh, the Age of Exploration, all of these things are directly connected to this. If this invention had come out in Africa, the world would look very different. If this invention had come out in China, the world would look very different. If this invention had come out in India or in any of the Arab nations, this would look very different in 2020. Now the reason for this is, is once the printing press came out, most people relied on a priest in their village or one that traveled into the town to get interpretations of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament being uh, what Jews and Christians would believe in. New Testament, only the Christians believe in the New Testament. The Jews say the New Testament is not their document. Now, think about this. Up until this point, most people didn't know how to read unless they were monks and they were educated at a very young age, often Jesuits and, and uh, groups like this that uh, emphasized an education. And then monks would sit around and brew beer and then transpose and oftentimes translate the Bible word by word to columns per page. If you mess up one letter, that's the end of that page, start from scratch. And all day they would sit around and handwrite copies with a quill and ink the entire Bible. To put this in context, the Old Testament is 622,000 words roughly. That's the equivalent of 2,400 pages. Now the New Testament is shorter. It is 184,000 words, and that would be the equivalent of 738 pages. You combine these two documents, and you've got over 3,100 pages. Imagine handwriting with a feather, a quill, and a little ink every single page of the Bible. So books back then became incredibly valuable because they were handwritten. Each one was unique. It's like kind of like a Rolls Royce. They're built to your, your uh, liking and they're built from scratch and no two look the same. So when the printing press comes out, you could put letters backwards, put that on a piece of ink, slide a piece of paper in, and boom, you've got the page automatically. Next page, boom. And you could do this much, much faster, and then you could bind these books together, which when there's more of them, the price comes down. When there's more of them, there's going to be a demand for this. And with that demand comes the need to be educated and to learn how to read. So Europe gets a head start on the whole world because of this invention. 
I can draw a through line from the printing press all the way to the last day of this class and current events that are happening today. This is an incredibly important invention and an incredibly important slide. So it was created by Johann Gutenberg. Oftentimes you hear it called the Gutenberg Press rather than the printing press. And now books can be mass produced. This allowed the Bible to be mass produced, which was the major book at the time, especially in Europe. And before the printing press, obviously all books had to be handwritten. Now, because you could get a book yourself, if you learned how to read, you didn't need to rely on somebody else's interpretation of it. You could read it yourself and have your own interpretation of the Bible. So, this ignited a thirst for education and a thirst to be educated and then the ability to learn how to read. But what this also causes is when a large part of the population begins to read the Bible and interpret it on their own, it's gonna create a split in the church known as the Reformation, in which Catholics will remain on the line they were on, and now you have a new group of Christians known as the Lutherans, and we'll get into Martin Luther here shortly. But this slide right here, incredibly important. This comes out anywhere else in the world. The world does not look the way it does today. So, this gave Europe a humongous head start on a number of different things, and we will talk about this slide all year. Now there is a saying, and the saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when any entity gains a bunch of power and a bunch of influence, oftentimes it opens the door for corruption. Now, this piece of paper that you see above me here, this is called an indulgence. And we'll get to what an indulgence was, but do keep in mind in Europe, we used to have feudalism. Feudalism died out with the power of monarchies, the power of the church. Now when you have the power of the monarchies, and you have the power of the church, now they're competing for power. They want the best art. They want the best military. They want all of the top things. So popes begin to compete with Italian princes. A lot of the uh, Italian princes were the Medicis for political power. So now you have monarchs vying with the representatives of the religion for that power. Very important concept here. Now popes continue to live incredibly lavish lifestyles. You're gonna see the monarchs and the popes are gonna have more gold, more jewels, more opulence, more really nice things while the people are suffering. And they're gonna then turn around and tell the people, you should suffer. This is what your life is like. And then you can have a nice life in the afterlife. But if you remember the Renaissance went away from saying life on earth is destined to be crappy and we'll, we'll live in the afterlife to you can have a good life on earth and you can have a good afterlife as well if that's your belief system. So what happens? The popes live lavishly, the people look at that and say, wait a second. Right here in the Bible, it says, a rich man has as much chance of getting into heaven as a camel has to pass through the eye of a needle. So why is the pope living this way? So the people begin to question, which is not allowed because you could be excommunicated for questioning the church or any representative of the church. So nobody really whispered this out loud until Martin Luther comes around. Now, popes are gonna hire painters and sculptors to beautify churches. The Sistine Chapel in Vatican City is the greatest example of this. Some of the best artists in the history of the world went to the Sistine Chapel and created all kinds of art. If you've ever been in the European cathedrals, you'll see the beautiful stained glass. All of that was very expensive at the time and used as a way to draw in the most popular and best individuals during the Renaissance to these areas. Now to finance these projects, you gotta raise money. So how do monarchs raise money? They tax people, right? People weren't super excited about being taxed to fight a bunch of wars that they weren't necessarily uh, involved with. So the people are gonna get resentful of that. And then the Catholic Church, what is one thing that they can do to raise money? They can tax the two things that if you're Catholic, you essentially have to do. You have to get baptized. And back then, it was very, very likely that you were going to get married because marriage wasn't so much about love as it was a contract between two families or a dowry being exchanged or some way of securing your own financial future. That's what marriage looked like back then. So the Catholic Church started to tax, number one, marriages and baptisms. And that's something if you're Catholic, you have to do. You have to get baptized. And oftentimes you have to get married and divorce. In this time period, not an option. We're going to talk about Henry VIII pretty soon. That's the first time it becomes an option. And even then, not very popular because in the Bible, 
divorce is not something that you're allowed to do. So, the final straw for a lot of people was this piece of paper. And this piece of paper that you see above me is called an indulgence. And what indulgences were is the Catholic Church would travel around village to village and they would have a line and what they would do is they would say, you can confess to a priest, which does wash away your sins, but if you want your sins officially washed away, you gotta buy a piece of paper, a receipt to prove it. And these become known as indulgences. Now keep in mind, in Catholicism, if you don't wash away your sins, up until the 1980s, you spent time in purgatory in order to wash away those sins. Then Pope John Paul II changed some of the rules about purgatory and Catholicism. That's a more modern context that we're going to talk about. But if you weren't baptized and you were young, you would go to purgatory to wash off that amount of sins, and then there was a choice to go to heaven or hell. If uh, you yourself didn't go to confession and you had sins on your soul when you passed away, you'd have to burn those off in purgatory. So indulgences first started directly to the consumer. Buy this piece of paper and prove that your sins are washed away. So when you die, you got the proof, and so does your family. And then this became so popular because nobody wants to go to hell and nobody wants to spend time in purgatory that then the Catholic Church would travel from town to town and say, not only do you need to wash away your sins, but your dead relatives do as well. Grandma's in hell right now and she's screaming, and if you buy this piece of paper, you can get grandma out of hell. And that's a powerful message during this time period. So the Catholic Church starts selling indulgences to the already deceased. And at a certain point, Martin Luther comes around and says, enough is enough, which is a very risky thing to do back then. Because keep in mind, excommunication during this time period was worse than torture. People would seek, if given the choice, to be tortured to death rather than to be excommunicated. So this is going to be a big, important theme, and it shows you the risk that Martin Luther took when he took it.